Good morning. I'm uh, doing a little introduction. I'm Mark Dam. I'm the uh, founder, and I wear a couple hats and fuse forward. One is the CTO, which is my favorite one, and then I also run the business as well, so I kind of keep everything going. Um, on the fuse forward team, we have a few people in the back here, Duncan and uh, Wyatt, which are part of our uh, sales and marketing organizations, and we have a couple of our marketing folks over here who've been instrumental in putting everything together. Um, and then on our partner side, um, we have um, a couple of the folks from uh, Jordan and Callum in the back there from uh, CoLogix. So those are going to hear from us today. We're going to go through about an hour's worth of uh, information, a little bit of a, a walkthrough of three things that we're going to talk through today. Some security, connectivity, and operations. Fuse Forward's kind of on the bookends of that. And then our friends at CoLogix are going to share some of the concepts of the connectivity side and what's happening inside the data center. A couple little um, ideas here. How many people are in the IT operation side of the house today? Okay. How many people are actually working right now with vendors and or customers trying to go through and put network connectivity together? Okay. So, so it's a mixed bag, right? And then how many are anybody working on specifically using cloud infrastructure today? Or is it a mixed hybrid? Are you just starting your journey? Or is it the process of you've actually got a lot of workloads out there? How many with lots of workloads? How many just started? Okay, so it's a little bit of a, of a new one. What I'm going to say is, Fuse Forward, we've, we've been uh, working in the cloud with AWS since 2013, uh, when they allowed us to go and create what they call virtual private clouds. Prior to that, we were working with hosting companies, organizations where we ran physical gear inside data centers. And we've been doing that since about 2007. So we've got a lot of history going through and managing all this kind of infrastructure, managing it all, securing it all, and creating all the connectivity and things. Our customer base has ranged everything from small little organizations and small businesses all the way up to large, complex organizations, municipalities, utilities, including um, organizations. One of the ones that we like to showcase right now is uh, the, the London cycle hire scheme in the city of London. We basically run that whole bicycle rental network for the City of London. It's hosted out of AWS with private network connections into a real-time data center or a real-time operations center, and it does dynamic dispatching to all the field crews in order to move bikes around. So those are the kinds of things that we're very aware of, and it's both a public sector and a private sector issue there. So we basically had to deal with a number of security issues with that. So what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of what are the three options that we can do. I'm Mark, I think it's Jordan and Calum are gonna do a presentation on connectivity, and Raheem's here to support us and make sure that nobody gets lost in the process, and we're required, we are an AWS technology and consulting partner, so we're very aware of all the different technical challenges with AWS, as well as other cloud, clouds and, and all of the needs of customers when they look at hybrid deployments. So I'm gonna talk about security, I'm going to talk about operations, and in the middle, we're going to go through and allow, uh, and, and Kalaj is going to present on connectivity. So here's the agenda, 15 minutes, a little bit on three topics, and then we're going to have a bit of a Q&A panel. So hopefully you guys, if you've got questions, feel free to ask as we go along, but we also have specific uh, discussion at the end for another 15 minutes, and then a little bit of a quiz game at the end, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be our marketing guys love to give away toys to people, so we always give away stuff at almost all the events nowadays. And it's the, it's the Amazon Echo. If you're using it, I've got one at home. My kids like to go through and talk to Alexa all the time. Okay, turn on the lights, uh, turn on the music, and then do all the uh, funny quizzes and everything else that they ask for nowadays. All right, so let's jump in. Um, Andy Jassy is the uh, AWS CEO. He says, companies that don't innovate find the sales of the tail end and suddenly well behind. If you start looking at today, adoption of the cloud is a major driver. And yet there's always issues right now about what's gonna happen. If you're not looking at what cloud deployments are and how to leverage that whole dynamic auto scaling environments and containerization and the new technologies, eventually you're gonna be leapfrogged. We've seen that with people like Netflix, with Uber, where a technology provider comes to the table and fundamentally changes the industry <coughs> marketplace. Amazon themselves did it in the book industry, okay, by going through and creating a different distribution channel and then creating an online store mechanism. And now we're seeing different players starting to say, I've got to catch up to that. Walmart's trying to catch up to Amazon. So if we look at it, what is that thing and how do we go and leverage the cloud? And when we start looking at those questions, 
we always start to ask some questions around that as to what's going on in that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cloud security because according to top five concerns of CXOs, that's CEOs, CFOs, CTOs, CIOs, the number one issue that everybody has right now with digital transformation projects is security. Now, I don't know if you guys, but you know, every day I see another article in my Flipboard feed about a security hack. You know the one I got this morning? Microsoft got hacked. Five. They left. They didn't hack. They didn't get hacked. Let's let's put this in concept con context. They left open five servers and storage mechanisms with all their customer service data, all the names of the customers, all the support tickets and all of the information related to the resolution of those support tickets, including who the person's name was, the contact information, and all their identity information. Wow, that's big. When a tech company can't manage their own configurations, we start asking a question, Forbes Magazine, that was, it was in Forbes this morning, first thing. And I was like, oh my gosh. That is telling us a little bit about cybersecurity. We go from, we look at different cases, we always wonder, what is it that's actually driving the need for security? Is the security because of a misconfiguration? Is it because of a hacker? Everybody's heard of Edward Snowden. We all have, okay? Snowden did not hack a system. Snowden had privileged user credentials. He walked in the front door, took the stuff, and walked back out the front door. It wasn't a hack. Okay, and a lot of things today when we start looking at it, we start wondering what are all the different things that we need to be addressing when it comes down to security of a system. Okay, cloud and all the other ones. So the kinds of things that we have to look at is we've got people coming in with ransomware. So there's cases where they're locking down servers. We have municipalities on a regular basis right now getting locked down. We have large government sector agencies, other ones being locked down. And they're all coming in and saying, I'm getting PCs. When I lock down the PCs, I'm going to hold you to ransom for those. We've got different architectures and validations and other vendor research. Who is it? How many vendors do you need in order to secure your different environments? We've got the data corruption, misconfigurations of systems. We have network breaches coming in where somebody leaves a hole in a firewall policy that's not properly set. And then we have the ones which a lot of people hear about, which is denial of service attacks. But denial of service attacks are usually the ones where they have a public internet facing environment and it's pinging and they're sending a lot of traffic towards the DDoS, okay? So there's all kinds of challenges around security that we have to be aware of. So, Amazon uses this model to describe um, the shared responsibility model. And guess what, Microsoft, Microsoft has an, a comparable model to this. Um, Google GCP actually doesn't publish one, okay? It's not up there in where they go and describe it because it's a little bit of a different model for them, we think. But both of those do say, you know, what the vendor of a public cloud or even a hosting company is doing is providing security of the infrastructure itself. Okay, so let's take as an example, everybody heard of the city, city bank and the breach on Citibank, right? It wasn't a breach and, and says, well, AWS was responsible. It's like, no, they weren't. It was an S3 bucket by their own internal IT team that was managing that infrastructure. That's the security in the cloud. So that means that you're given all of this power, okay? You're given all this infrastructure of servers, storage, database systems, networks, and you've got a virtualization server, no different than if you put VMware on top of it and able to do that. Whenever you go through and deploy an application, you're still responsible for all the rest of the stuff. Client side, uh, encryption of all of your data, how you manage all your encryption keys. You're still responsible for the server side and all the file systems on the servers. You're responsible to make sure that the code doesn't have hack points in it. Okay, you, you're responsible for the operating system, the firewall configurations, because you can open it up or close it down depending upon who you want access to. You need to look at the platform, the identity management and all the access services, and you also need to look at the actual data inside. If you let a, a contractor into your application to configure it, that means they have access into the data sets. That's something that you have to control with policy or with some other mechanism to go and do that. So when we think about this, we start thinking about the multi-layers of security that you need to start considering. And hopefully I'm giving you a little bit of food for thought, but I want to share with you just things that you want to consider. It's a, it's a stepping stone approach. 
we've been doing some work for the Department of National Defense. And part of that is, is how did they and the federal government and military organizations start using the cloud? Okay, so part of what we've been doing is a pilot project to go and show that you can actually use a public cloud environment and walk through the different layers to protect access to classified data. So how do we do this? Let's start in the middle, okay? At the heart of everything is your applications and data. You start there, it's gonna be located somewhere. If you're currently running on-premise today, it's running on servers in your environment. Um, I know a local municipality and they put all their servers in their financial vault. Okay, that's an interesting place. Well, it's secure, okay, at the end of the day, okay? But at the end of the day, during the day, people are still going in and out of the vault. So it's not, it's still got a door to get in physically. Think of that like the cloud. At the end of the day, you're gonna put your application somewhere virtually, sitting on site servers in some environment. And you have to let people in and out, okay? How do we go through and deal with now all the different layers to get in and out, to use an application, and to use the data? So let's talk about the first thing, encryption, okay? The things that we wanna consider under encryption is classification of the data sets. So I talked about Edward Snowden earlier. One of the things that I look at as the most secure piece of data you have to have is your privileged user. Who are they? Your system administrator it has to have their user credentials, their security keys, and everything that they have, and never give them God rights. I don't let them touch everything. Give them certain silo application components for that. So we look at that as part of the classification of the data sets. All the way through to non-confidential web-based content, which, again, you want the public to see. Or, if, if I was talking with the public libraries, if you think about some of the content in there, books are free, okay? Some of the books are there as part of it, so it's part of that process of what's that classification of content that you're giving to your customers versus what are you actually using you need to protect. We go down all the way through to different types of encryption. Do you need to have it hashed and salted, i.e. the data is fully encrypted? Or can it be at 256, or does it need to be a 2,000-bit encryption? Those are based upon the classifications. What's the method of access? If a privileged user is going in, should they be going in with a VPN? Should they be going in with an MFA token? Or should they be going in from a trusted device only on a private network connection? Okay, and we'll talk about what the private network connections are. And then the other one is, is how do you do data in flight? How do you manage all of that? And how do you go through those pieces to manage all the different components within the environment and external to the environment? So that's the encryption layer. Layer number two, the user access. The key one on this one is the difference between a privileged user and an end user. We had one of our clients go through and they had an internal penetration testing process underway. And they were going through and they had been putting both their privileged users and their end users in their same Active Directory environment. And they had, and the security uh, consultants came along and said, well, that's not really a good practice. So, and then they had the external customers and the people that are accessing the system in the same environment too. That means that they had to start exposing more and more directories to the public internet to let people validate. So part of that is, is one of the key things you want to consider when you're doing user access is segregating out your privileged users from your end users, not just in the way of roles and security rights, but also in the way of physical directories and physical logging credentials so that you're actually tracking who's coming in from the back door, which is where a privileged user comes in, versus who's coming from the front door, which is an end user coming in. Are you going to use MFA and single sign-on? The more that you can link that in, once you've got that and you're linking it in with single sign-on, you also have a tracking history of where they all went to. So we look at it and say, all right, if I've got a privileged user coming in, I want to know where did they go. I want to know when they logged into a server. I want to know what they did on the server when they were in there. And I want to know what data sets they might have looked at or what files they took away. So that's all part of that whole tracking mechanism that gets enabled with a single sign-on environment and also links in with multi-factor authentication. We're even moving towards not just multi-factor authentication, but passwordless authentication mechanisms. I've talked about directories a little bit, and then the last, the other one is, what entitlements does, an app, does a user have? Do they have access to go into your financial system and your customer system and your uh, work order management system, or should they only get one? Okay, or should they have different roles within each one, and how do you do role-based management? all linking into single sign-on. Few things to consider under the user management paradigm. All right, let's give you the third, okay? Third layer on this, which is where we always spend a lot of time and money, perimeter security. Firewalls, we've all heard of them, DDoS attacks. 
that's where the users are trying to come in. And one of the big ways that we look at this is how do we lock it all down from a firewall policies? What ports do we open up? What protocols do we allow? So as an example, we had a big case um, over the last little while, which was people and all the websites were using HTTP, and now they're moving towards HTTPS on everything, and everything should be certificate-based with a secure website. Okay, great. That's all part of the protocol. And you basically want to be allowing that so that everything in behind your systems, you're also securing the traffic inside your environment as well with all that perimeter security. And that includes firewalls on your application servers as well. Okay? How many people are familiar with IPS and IDS? Intrusion detection and protrusion prevention systems. So again, how do you monitor the traffic coming in? How do you look at signatures? How do you keep the signatures up to date all the time? And what we also find is when you start looking at not just IDS and IPS, you're also starting to look at event data coming through and saying, how do I track and monitor all the different event data that's coming with that? DNS resolution. I'm going to share one last piece on this one, and that gets into the VPNs versus private networks versus internet exposure. So I'm going to give a little bit to the guys at, at CoLogix when we go through that, but we by default try never, we, we don't allow any privileged users in unless there's a minimum of VPN, and depending upon whether it's SOX compliant or whether it's GDPR or whatever that might look like, it's even locked down to Mac devices, on-site devices, or even locations. So it's, it's all driven to a site-to-site -site VPN, or it's even down into a private network. Private networks, when I was talking about Transport for London, we only use private networks. So that whole environment is fully locked down, and you can't get into it from a public device. Even to the point where the op center uses virtual desktops. So if they want to be a privileged user going in, you actually have to log in to a virtual desktop, linked in to an Active Directory environment in order to go through and work on any environments. And that's a whole lockdown environment. Okay? So those are things that you can consider. Those are all things to go and lock down this great world of cloud. Okay? Now, when I talk about all that, there's an interesting challenge. How many different vendors are involved in trying to go through and solve all the stuff at the top? We did a count, we had Gartner come in. It was 70 to 150 vendors, products that you would need to put together to solve everything in order to handle the blue section of this. That's a big daunting challenge, isn't it? Okay? I know, <laughs> we've been through it. Okay, we had to go through and say, we are on the nut for our customers to go through and manage the security. So we have to go through each one of those and choose and figure out what the right piece is to plug into all the different components of this. So one of the approaches, while I'm not trying to share with it, one of the things we look at is we looked at how do we go through and create a pattern or how do we go and create a system design that has those pieces in it? How can you put them all together? And we've done part of that. I'm not trying to do a sales pitch here. I want to just give you a little bit that some of those things are the things that you need to do. So either you do it yourself, which a lot of people have been doing and they've been doing that on premise. You can also do it in concert with somebody, okay, systems integrator of choice, or you can actually go through and work with other providers, okay? But those are things that you want to consider. Hopefully I've given you a little bit of education on the security front, okay? And I'm gonna hand it over to uh, CoLogix to talk a little bit about connectivity. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Well, that was, that was eye-opening. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not a big security guy. I don't know a lot about security, but I think I might have to change a few of my passwords after. Uh, 65 of them? Yeah, probably. I've been using like the, you know, Google or Apple recommended like super long one. How, what, what's your take on that? Is that? That's so, why they're saying to go to passwordless environments. Oh, okay. Because super long is still hackable, <coughs> okay. but we still use them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what important to take away from what Mark was sharing and what we're about to share is that obviously it's, it's vastly different. We're, he's talking about security. We're talking about connectivity. But the theme today is the journey to the cloud and there's a lot of components to that. That last slide kind of alluded to that. There's a number of steps that you need to take to get there. Q's forward's a piece of it. I'm really happy you're handling that piece of it and we're handling our piece of it because it's a little bit more uh, simpler. Um, of a job, but I guess the whole point is AWS provides a component and services for cloud migrations and cloud journeys. Fuse4 does, Cologix does, and a number of other providers. So today, Callum and I are going to talk to you about connectivity. My name is Jordan. Hi, it's Callum. Callum. We're both account directors uh, for Cologix here in Vancouver. 
We're going to tell you a little bit about Cologix just as a foundation. We're going to tell you a little bit about um, how you connect to the cloud and specifically obviously we're going to focus on Vancouver and we're going to focus on AWS today. So we're in 10 different markets uh, across North America, three in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal. We actually host AWS's compute and on-ramps in all of those markets in Canada. And we're actually the second um, provider of cloud on-ramps in North America, only behind Equinix and only by a couple. So for a smaller organization, Equinix is global, massive uh, company. Uh, we're only 300 people um, and we're in 10 markets with 30 data centers, but we're the second provider of cloud on-ramps and AWS is a, a very large uh, customer and partner of ours. So our platform, as I was alluding to, those are our markets. Um, you can tell a uh, number of data centers um, where we have hyperscale facilities like we just built here in Vancouver, uh, which opened in September. Uh, we have uh, care hotel facilities like in Harper Center here, which some of you are customers in some of these sites. And then in our Van 2 site, which is at 1050 West Pender, which is actually where the AWS cloud on-ramp for Western Canada lives. And we've kind of marketed ourselves as a, you know, the leader in, in a connected ecosystem. And what that means is uh, we provide, you know, the most amount of uh, service providers. And we also kind of piggyback that with our ecosystem of cloud on-ramps. So we provide all five of the major cloud providers here. And a big part of that, I was describing to Janet earlier, is that we have data sovereignty in Canada. So we maintain those cloud on-ramps only in Canada. So it's a, a really a huge part of what we do. and. At the end of the day, this you know this CoLogix ecosystem with the cloud providers, with the service providers, it allows you to connect easily and seamlessly, and that's at the end of the day what you want to do is it wants to be easy for you, and it, and it makes it economical as well, being having all these service providers and cloud on ramps in our facilities. So there's a little bit on the, the ecosystem there. We have all those internet exchanges in Ohio, in, in Quebec. Uh, all over the place there, we've got the service providers and then we have those, those cloud on-ramps. So it's really uh, a holistic ecosystem of connectivity uh, and it really allows you to kind of connect to all the peers that you want to and ultimately all the eyes that, that you want to, to generate business. So Cologic is, a, is an infrastructure company. We build data centers, we connect them together, we connect the markets together and we're really interconnection hubs. Um, in those markets and all of these logos um, provide services in and out of our data centers and people come and co-locate with us to get this connectivity. This is where the real value comes from and this is why cloud service providers like AWS choose providers like Cologix because of the access that they get to these networks meaning they can reach more of their customers and they have a variety of ways to do that. And there should really be probably another column that we'll input here that will actually have cloud service providers. So there's the major five and then there's a number of others that are um, coming up as well. So specifically about Vancouver, what we have going on here, I mean the important thing to note, again, because we're here, AWS uh, has chosen us. That's where their network node is. That's how you can connect to AWS uh, in Vancouver. It's at our Vantu site. Come up to Calum and I after. We can host you guys for a tour. We can actually physically show you where their point of presence is in that data center. Um, it's pretty impressive. We're the region's largest co-location provider. Van3 out there on the outskirts is our uh, new data center that we're actually, since Raheem left, the room trying to court some of the other cloud service providers <laughs> into that space as well just to give it there'll be a slide comment that you'll see will show kind of the markets and where everyone is and you'll see that AWS has a, has, a, has a strong position here they're the only cloud service provider currently with a presence in this market really in any west of um, Toronto in, in Canada um, so that's important for the public sector that has data sovereignty requirements or any other business that might um, require that as well. Um, were you going to talk about this? Yeah, so, this, yeah. Um, 
So Lake Jordan State, we have we have Van One, Van Two downtown. Uh, Van One is part of the Harbor Center, which has the Carrier Hotel, the Internet Exchange as well. Um, Van Two is our kind of redundant area. It has a, it's basically an enterprise annex to that to that Carrier Hotel. So we have redundant power there. Um, that thing can run for for basically 48 hours if something you know catastrophic were to happen. So it's really the alternative and the redundant location for connectivity in downtown Vancouver. Um, Van 3 is our new facility, uh, that's pretty much brand new and at the very least if you guys want to come and do a tour and see how to spend uh, 8 million bucks on a building, that can be an option. Uh, it's pretty impressive what we've done, uh, it's really kind of setting the standard certainly in Western Canada for data centers and, and what we're able to do. And like I said before, what is going on here? Go. So we are the on-ramp provider. Uh, what that means is that we have access to all five of these on-ramps. Um, one of them is in Vancouver currently with Amazon. We do have another one coming online uh, in March, uh, which is pretty exciting for us. Um, again, get in contact with us if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, and at the end of the day, these on-ramps provide you, you know, low latency connection, uh, it's direct connection. You can cut down your internet consumption with the direct connection. It provides an economical uh, mechanism of connecting to the cloud that's completely secure. So sure. we'll dig into that a little bit. So I'm going to touch on two ways. Callum's going to touch on the third way. There's three ways to connect to cloud service providers. The first one is through the internet. That's probably the most common today because historically that's kind of how cloud connectivity um, was initiated and was born, but because more and more utilization, more adoption, more bandwidth, um, the internet is not the best medium to do that now, so it's slowly being kind of phased out of a means to actually connect to cloud service providers like AWS. AWS was one of the first, and that's where a lot of their legacy connections are with a lot of their customers, so the internet's the first way. The second way is through a direct connect. That's what Amazon calls their cloud on ramp, but that's the term that's used to buy a cross connect directly to a cloud service provider on ramp or compute node. So if you were a customer in our Van2 data center, you could buy a simple cross connect within that data center where we would plug a piece of fiber from your equipment and your cabinet directly over into AWS's on ramp and you hit their cloud uh, immediately that way. So that's the second way that you can do that. And you can do that anywhere that they have a presence. And if you, you know, in the news, they're all vastly expanding. They're all buying up co-location space everywhere possible. They're building data centers everywhere possible. And it's to move their um, on-ramps and their compute as close to their customer bases as possible for all the benefits that are derived from doing that. So that's the second way. And Tom, we'll talk to you about the third way. Yeah, so the third way is really, really exciting for us as a company. Uh, this is called the Cloud Access Marketplace, or CAM for short. We had this developed in-house, and it's now deployed in all of our data centers. So what it allows our clients to do is combine all their cloud connections, whether you're using Outlook with Azure, um, you're using AWS for data storage, or when you have a CRM with Oracle, you can combine all those into one port, and then we can actually connect all your Ethernet connections to that port. So what you now have the ability to do, and your, and your management team would probably be frothing in the mouth to learn this, is they can then uh, toggle and throttle all their bandwidths and your cloud usage uh, in our interface, and it's pretty much in real time, the response. So it allows your management to be completely streamlined, and the side effect of that as well is it actually combines all your connection costs that you might be paying for monthly, independently, into one bit of hardware and one fee structure. So it does get you a gain on ROR uh, with our cloud access marketplace. We're hoping to build this thing up like crazy uh, over the next few years, and we're going to include you know, SaaS products, we're going to include all the ISPs on here, so you can basically toggle and decide what you want to connect with our interface. Really, really exciting stuff uh, coming out of Denver. So. so it's called a hosted connection, and there's a few different options in the marketplace for this right now. This is our, this is our uh, product offering to the market. You might be familiar with Megaport. That's probably one of the more um, well-known uh, brands when it comes to a hosted connection platform. Um, and there are even uh, our competitors like in Equinix. Equinix has their own version of this. There's network service providers like Zeo that have their own version called CloudLink. 
So there are similar um, there are similar product offerings to our Cologix Access Marketplace. The point is the type of a connection is called a hosted connection because something's in the middle of getting you to the cloud, whether it's you know Megaport, whether it's us, whether it's somebody else. And again, the benefits for doing that are more flexibility, more scalability, and you're outsourcing a bit of the management of that connection to a provider that can provide value based on some other services and nice to have stuff for your IT team. So internet, direct connect, and hosted connection are the three ways that you can get to AWS or any other cloud service provider. So just showing again our markets, kind of how we enable that through our um, Cologix Access Marketplace, um, where what cloud service providers live where and how we're, as soon as you get connectivity to us somewhere, you could be a customer in Lakeland, Florida, and you say, hey, I want to get to Google in Montreal. Well, we can get you there, just buy a port into our hosted switch, and we can pull you uh, all the way up, up there to have that connectivity. So that's the benefits of a host connectivity. So this is the slide I was mentioning before. Vancouver obviously sticks out, as I said. AWS is the only ones here, so they have first mover advantage um, in this market as it relates to trying to scoop up as much business as possible. Otherwise, a lot of the clubs, and these are just our markets. This isn't like North America. This is just where Cologix is and what we can offer. So there's definitely a gap there, and I think that gap is probably going to be filled pretty soon, but that's why AWS has been a strong partner. I think their Direct Connect on-ramp in our data center has been live for two to three years now, probably, I think, 2017, somewhere around there. Um, we have about a, a few dozen connections that customers have enabled directly to AWS currently. A lot of those are actually from network service providers. So tier one backbone providers, ISPs, carriers, because they want that connectivity to AWS in this market to be able to offer that to their customer base. And there's great value in AWS getting those connections live as well. Kind of a redundant slide, but again, Vancouver sticks out for you. AWS is there versus all the com competition that's in that market. It makes sense, Montreal and Toronto, a lot of population in those cities. Montreal specifically for data centers, all the compute lives there, cheap power uh, and real estate for them to be hosted in that, that area. John, who is shipping the people for Cross Connect and this like uh, virtual internet that you provide? So yeah, I mean it's all within our facility, so it's we we enable all the connectivity. So all the but physical you know, I'm asking you know, who who is the vendor that you're using? Oh, that's a good question. Like for the hardware. For the hardware, exactly. Is it yeah. Sienna or it's Sienna, I think it's a mixture of Sienna and Juniper. Okay. Yeah. I know AWS is a big Juniper um, buyer, but uh, for us we do a mixture just depending on the, the cloud service provider, the market our existing network in that market, it's a mixture. And then just in summary, why would customers choose an AWS Direct Connect over perhaps a hosted connection or a uh, connectivity over the internet? Lower risk than the public internet, security, uh, reduced rates um, because of the ability to connect directly, um, improved performance, and that's mainly done through controlling latency and your bandwidth because you're right next to or very close to and then connecting directly into the AWS network uh, and the ability to enable hybrid architectures as well. So um, those are all the different benefits um, that we can help customers with by A, we're the host of their on-ramp, but B, we also enable that connectivity for customers. And I think that's it. And of course, the data sovereignty is part of that as well, especially in Canada. Um, before we finish, there's a little housekeeping. We do have goodie bags over here. Uh, they've got a wireless speaker in them. <laughs> Fantastic for the golf cart or the art studio, whatever, whatever tickles your fancy. So uh, please feel free to grab them. Thank you. Back to Mark. Yep. All right. So just to give you a little rundown, we do have a network connection on the Direct Connect in Cologix facilities with Zayu, and it back calls into our actual office in Falls Creek. So we actually, from our own security ops center and everything else, we do everything with private network connections. 
Okay, so it's one of those key things, and it gets us down into both solving it. We actually started working with the Direct Connects and creating a whole ability to even go through and segregate them up into uh, virtual interfaces about five years ago is when we first started. So we're fairly well adapted to understanding everything that these guys have just put in place. So let me talk a little bit about the cloud journey, okay? Um, we go through and we say, okay, you gotta deal with the security issues. We wanna go through and address how you're gonna connect to it, whether you're gonna use VPNs, whether you're gonna go through and what you're gonna expose to the operations. That was the security, that's the connectivity side. The last thing on the cloud journey that you always wanna look at is, all right, now what workloads am I gonna put in there? And how am I gonna manage those workloads? And then the question comes into a little bit is, are they gonna be hybrid? So are they gonna be a combination of on-premise infrastructure, even if it's inside a cage in a data center? And then how much is gonna be in the virtual world? So with things like Direct Connects, you have the ability to go through and have a rack of gear to go through and run certain workloads and be able to burst into the cloud or split the workloads and put some of it in the cloud in, in an AWS environment and some of it inside a cage. The other thing that AWS has today as well, um, we're actually just in the process of procuring a development node, which is what they call an outpost. It's a 42U rack version of AWS that sits inside a data center. Okay, and it's now, it got released, um, I got the news two days ago, that it's now available in Canada. It was announced a year and a bit ago, but it's now available in Canada, and that's now coming about, about two days ago into general availability. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about operations. So when you're out there now and you've got workloads, you've got applications, what are the things and what are some of the challenges that we're running into in the world today? So how many people use containers today? You guys using any containerized workloads? A little bit? Some of the VMware or at least virtual server infrastructure probably. And remember the world when we used to run everything bare metal, then we went to virtualization, now we're moving to containers, okay? <coughs> Really, it's not that much different, okay? It's just a new paradigm layer, and I'm gonna date myself, but I used to work in the lab at IBM many, many years ago, and it was on a product called VM and MVS, Multiple Virtual Systems and Virtual Machines, and that was way back in the late 80s, okay? So, all of those things in that virtualization layer has been there for 30 years, and all we've been doing is decreasing the size of what those virtual machines are. But it's becoming increasingly complicated because in a containerized environment, you can have thousands of them. That means that you're gonna be looking at scaling up and scaling down all of those different containers. So I look at that blue, and of course, you gotta realize we come at this from an enterprise IT perspective. So whenever we see orange, great, somebody's taking care of that. Blue, oh my gosh, that's a big animal to take. And I grew up in the application world working for utilities, so I know how big of a problem that can be. So I said, all right, so let's go through. I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of an education here on things that we've considered as we went through this. So whenever we've been running applications for large organizations, we, we, run, uh, we run all the apps for Jones Lang LaSalle, JLL, you know, CBRE, total, it's a three billion euro a year uh, facilities management company and property management firm. We run all of their apps for their FN business. And part of the challenge we had was we got seven different vendors, about eight different applications, and we have to go through and look at how to go and do the provisioning, run it, and how do we go through and deal with the automation components to that. So things are gonna go through, I'm gonna go through each one of them and give you some of the things you wanna consider during each one of these stages. So in the past, we would have taken away the whole bottom and not even considered it because we'd be doing it all manually. Now there's tools like Chef, like Puppet, like Ansible, like Terraform, that all allow everything on the top to be automated but I'm gonna go into a little bit and describe what you can consider when you, when you deal with automation, which helps you go through and leverage the power of the cloud, okay? But let's first talk about operation or provision. When I think of provisioning, I think of how am I gonna go through and stand up the infrastructure? How am I gonna configure the middleware layer to go and allow me to install software? And then how am I gonna go through and install the software? And then how am I gonna do version management related to that? So things I want to consider, how do I harden up the OS? Okay, so as an example, if you go onto the AWS Marketplace, you can grab an AMI, an Amazon machine image, and use that as your base. Yep, and then there's a few things that you want to consider if it's Linux or Windows, and what you want to turn on and turn off in the way of flags. What about clustering? 
if I'm running an application and it's my website and I've got a million users, I want to be able to burst up and burst down based upon time of day and load. Because sometimes during the day it's busier than at night. Okay, so we want to be able to do clustering, be able to go through and balance it. We want to be able to load balance, we want to cluster things. And then how do we manage all the binaries and all of the things that we're using with respect to the code packages? And then how do we manage the configurations? So we want to consider how we're going to deploy apps and then how we're going to go and configure it every time there's a new version of the application coming up with a bug fix or something else with that. And the other one I always like to consider is what about the internal routing and the private domain name services within those environments? So those are all the things that we consider when you go into the provisioning environment as part of the cloud. You still got to do all that. Just like we did on-prem, you still do it in the cloud. But it's all through a console, and there's different places to go and do it. But you still have to do it. Okay. What about operations? So again, operations now, you've got this application running in the cloud. All right, and Or you've migrated your WordPress site, and you're running a WordPress application for your website. What are the things that you want to be considering during that process of managing it? All the logs. How am I grabbing all the logs? Okay, Where do they come from? Where am I storing them? So we have third parties and they're responsible for managing an application and every time the application crashes or has performance degradation, what's the first thing they want? I want all the log data. I want to look at the event information they get in, they start looking at all these logs. I was talking to one of my lead engineers yesterday and I was watching him and he said, hey Dinesh, man, that's, that's an interesting log file. I can actually read that one. I started in the day when they were all hexadecimal. And I was like, oh my god, that was so hard to go and figure out what was in those log records. But we still want to do that. It's still the core of running a system is log management. It helps us to go through then and do performance tuning. So one of the key things in an AWS environment, as an example, we have what we call CloudWatch. It allows us to go through and grab real-time information about CPU utilization, RAM utilization, <coughs> and network traffic onto VMs. Well, guess what? We put an the layer, and there's another layer you want to go to in a Java-based application. You want JVMs. And you want to start looking at all those things and how much you're using and how you can look at it, bursting up and bursting down. You want real-time monitoring so that you can basically get on top of a problem before a system crashes. And then as you start going through, there's this whole area of operations where you want to do cost optimization. Why would you want to be running 15 servers all the time when you only have load for about an hour a day that needs those 15 servers, and perhaps you only need to have one or two up during the rest of the time. That's cost optimization. So it links together with that automation side. And then of course, what about alerts and alarms? We have customers, as an example, that go through and say, you know, if a system goes down or I don't respond to a service ticket within 15 minutes, they get fined $15,000, okay? So are those alerts and alarms important? for a service provider depending upon the IT? Yes, it is, especially in the private sector. So when we start looking at that, we want to be aware of what are the other things that we want to attach to all of those applications in order to manage them. The last point, the last big box, and I like this one at the bottom because to me, automation is one of the key things that the cloud now provides in the way of our journeys. Because what we have available now, there's techniques called auto-scaling. And auto-scaling is not just auto-scaling up, it's also auto-scaling down. It's the ability to go through and burst workloads. And that's what I keep talking to when we start talking about clustering. And everybody, I, I've, had, I've had large systems integrators say, well, we can't do that because this is an old legacy system and this is the way we deploy it. And we say, well, hold on a second here. I can probably re-architect it and redeploy it in a different way to allow that change in the way it's being done. So we split across the JVMs for that. We look at different ways of splitting up the JVMs across different servers and creating separate deployment packages. Question we get into also, I put in this comment here about push versus pull of application changes. We, as an example, we got customers that have to have a very locked down production environment, but dev test cannot be. So what they say is, can they use Chef or Puppet as an automation tool? No, because it's what they call pull. Okay, it grabs and it's always pulling to pull into production. You can't do that in a controlled production environment, so you can't use those tools. But you can use Ansible because it's a push strategy. So that means that we can control the timing on which the automation, still use automation, but it's a different mechanism. It depends upon what kind of environment you're using and what your security regulations are and what you're, uh, what you're trying to do in the way of uh, managing that environment for production. 
And then the other one, of course, in automation is how do you automate the cloud configuration? You can automate it. You can come up with standard approaches for configuration. That means that every time you deploy again, it's like all these hacks with S3 buckets. If you've got a standard configuration that locks everything down when you set it up, then you basically have already got it with all the best practices embedded in it, and that helps you in your cloud journey and make sure it's all configured properly. Okay? So those are the kinds of things. Does that help? It, it kind of gives you a little bit of running an application. Things to consider as you go through that. Okay? And you don't need to do all, you can start with a small workload in order to do that. One of the things we've always considered is, how do we go and do that? So we've started to look at how do we go and provide tools to our customers to help with operations in the cloud. So we can handle the three, but guess what? There is no way that any service provider can stop a customer from reconfiguring their product when they have the front end to do it nor going in through the front door and going through and managing the data and keeping the data clean. Okay, that's always going to be a customer's responsibility. But you can always go through and look at different players um, and different service providers that can help you in the middle with the, uh, with the actual components. So there's a little bit right now on the operations side. I think I'm, I'm just got a couple of things here to leave you with and then I'm going to turn it over for some Q&A. So just a little bit, I think I've shared a little bit about us. We have three offices, Vancouver, Dublin, and Johannesburg. We're pretty much spread. Um, we're in the process of opening up other offices in other cities, both in the US and in Canada. Um, we're based here though. We are one of those Vancouver companies that a lot of people say, we've had to go elsewhere to do all of our work because in Canada, it's sometimes hard to basically buy local. Okay, but that's who we are and we've been here for over 20 years. We continue to work a lot south of the border, a lot back east, and a lot overseas. Um, we've been migrating, and we continue to help customers both migrate, maintain, and manage the applications. And one of our key taglines is we make complexity simple. So we patented all of our stuff related to how to do everything I shared with you because we thought, how do we go through and get rid of these big complex IT systems? And we can do that through automation, through different deployment patterns that we've discovered. So, we will leave that with you. Subscribe to our blog if you'd like it. We have a whole blog that we continue to provide this kind of content online to folks. And um, we, we are just down in Falls Creek across the water. Um, you can actually get there by boat, okay, if you'd like to, and get on a little ferry. Um, and our vision, a world free of complex IT projects, okay? So when we start looking at the parts, we think AWS is fantastic, it's a large, portfolio of parts. We put it all together. We like connectivity solutions, we put it all together, and we provide it as one seamless environment for our customers. Okay? So I want to leave that. Um, folks from CoLogix as well, if you guys got any questions now, we're opening up to a Q&A session. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one would be about like uh, the hardware that you mentioned that this is going to be available. You talk about that to UT rack that's available in two days? Is it was available, it's already available. It's already available. Okay. So it's called the AWS Outpost. Oh, so, so that's basically what it is. So, so basically, it's a rack that goes into the on-prem. It's a 42U rack that rolls in, okay? Um, Raheem can share yeah. more if he knows more than I do. I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty up to speed on this one. Yeah, you're, you're yeah. good start. So the, the AWS 42U rack has got different configurations oh, on it. Yeah. Okay, but it's all geared towards dealing with local residency requirements. So what it will address, as an example, we looked at it and said, all right, how can we continue to go through and provide data residency, say in BC, for legal services? Because they actually have rules here that any of the corporate incorporation documents are not allowed to leave the province. So we can put an outpost in CoLogix Data Center, roll it in, okay, fully managed by AWS, and then we manage it and put everything else that we have on top of it, and it's ready to go to receive application workloads. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All ready to go. Yeah. No more. Okay. Uh, you know, again, it's very geared towards uh, clients that have very stringent requirements for on-prem, and we wanted to make a subset of the services. So not everything's available in Outpost. It's the core AWS compute, storage, database uh, services, and then things will evolve as things as time goes on. But it's the core services that are available in the outpost platform.
containerization, um, Kubernetes is there, and so is um, MapReduce and all of the analytics tools. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Yep. Uh, and uh, the second question was uh, uh, that I intended to, to ask you is basically it's, it's a blur uh, for me, uh, that kind of border between what is actually fuels forward providing uh, and what is basically because like all the stuff that you're, you, you were talking about, like uh, AWS platform is actually providing. So what are the hooks that you basically use and provide additional value that was not kind of, you know, like clear? So let me give you an example. In our security product, we basically run a security edge in Ireland, Frankfurt, North Virginia, Oregon, Montreal, London, and soon to be Cape Town. What that security edge is, is approximately 150 virtual servers, containerized applications, all geared towards managing privileged users, end users, and all the security encryption management, all provided as a subscription service. It runs in AWS, but it's a lockdown environment. If you were to link in with the Direct Connect, we also have our own group, like we are basically a Direct Connect, we're a virtual Direct Connect customer, so we work with the service providers, the ISPs, and the data center operators, okay, where we actually manage all the ports on their behalf as well. So we're both an application managed service provider, as well as we actually have all of our own code and everything else deployed in that environment as well, okay? And on the Fuse control side, that is what we call a shared platform service. Again, most organizations would struggle to go and deploy all of the technologies you would need to do log management, application AMIs, automation scripting. So we provide it as a service with libraries already pre-built. So again, those are pieces we have. What we are intentionally doing on our presentation was trying to give you education. Okay, things that you need to consider. Still, we have stuff that actually solves the problem, but you can do it yourself too. Yeah, you know, like, I, I, I don't mind. Like, uh, you know, we've got partners that purely do build and we've got partners that do build, and uh, and what I mean by build is they actually are consulting shops, right, and they deliver professional services. What Fuse Forward has done is they've got that organization, plus they developed their own um, solution at the end of the day, and they offer that subscription. So bringing those two together is why they offer something very unique in the market. Uh, it's not for everyone, um, but you know when we when we hear customers, many of them that say say that we don't have large IT organizations. We don't want to build uh, anything. We don't want to manage it. We point right to, to Fuse Forward in that case, right? So, and we also partner with IT shops too. So we have a we can do it all. We can coach somebody through the journey, or we can do a hybrid model and be like a level three, and just provide them and consult them and, and provide a mixed model on that. Okay. So we have organizations like software vendors, independent software vendors south of the border. We're doing a hybrid model. We have different utility companies where we do 80% of it, and then we have a couple of organizations where we do 100%. Depends what they want us to do. Okay. Um, I had a question about uh, direct connect. Um, so I understand that you're wondering what's the hardware that's required for you to have in the logic location. That's a good question. Um, it, we don't have that answer because the hardware would be your hardware. We're not. We're not providing that. Hardware? Do a partner so we can. Okay, so if, if you're doing, so we run our own direct connects, and so where CoLogix usually fits is they have a port. And what we have to do is basically connect a port to port between it. If you're using and going through and saying, how do I connect in my on site environment, you typically need a firewall router on the other side that can handle BGP. Okay? And that's the, for, that's the only piece you need. If you want somebody to go and deliver that, we actually deliver that as part of our service, and we can drop that gear inside your shop to actually go through and manage the direct connect. That's again part of our few secure product. Okay. Right. Uh, one of the other questions that was asked uh, uh, is uh, why doesn't AWS own a direct connect location, uh, their own direct connect location? And I'm assuming whoever asked was asking for here. Uh, in Vancouver or Western Canada. Um, so the way I would answer that is uh, we have strategically made decisions and investments. In this case for Canada, our uh, availability zone, which is a group of data centers, is uh, situated in Montreal. Uh, I think everyone knows that, right? And we've got uh, multiple data centers that aggregate together across separate floodplains, electrical grids, 
and that's how uh, that's how we've designed the Canadian region from an AWS perspective. So we strategically place those data centers in certain areas. We've strategically partnered then with the likes of Cologix uh, and delivering services like Fuse Forward, where we are not uh, going to be situated, and we have no intentions right now. That could change of dropping in another availability zone in Western Canada or in Canada. And that's why we've got partners like Cologix to help us with that, right? So they're, they're the only partner, and I want to reinforce this, uh, Callum and, and Jordan covered this off, that offers true residency, data residency, um, from Western Canada into Eastern Canada, right, uh, into our data centers. So um, they offer something very unique uh, for us in the market. When you were speaking uh, in your first presentation about the uh, various um, choices one might make about AD and single sign-on multi-factor authentication, um, I started to wonder if there are best practices or recommendations if you have a blended environment for hosting some stuff and you're going to cloud for others about where you would put those specific aspects in your business. Um, I wouldn't say it's one or the other in the way of which is the best to provide, but let me give you a little some food for thought on that one, okay? Um, data residency is one issue. The ability to use content delivery is another. For Active Directory and single sign-on, in almost all of our customers, we always implement a hybrid strategy, okay? And what does that look like? It looks like, because they're usually using, off, if they're using Office 365, we link in their Azure directory services into a single sign-on environment, and we basically do a synchronization between the AWS environment, so applications inside AWS can leverage that AD for user management, coupled with an on-premise where you want to have your end user directory management. Whether it's Azure AD or whether it's an on-premise AD, you can create a synchronization environment for that. That's kind of one of the things that I would always recommend as you do that, but you, say, you get it down into what we call a single directory model, okay? But you can federate it and then you can synchronize it across. Okay, so that's one, okay? With respect to workload, what would you suggest inside AWS versus on-prem? Customers, the one part I always look at for, say, an AWS environment is the content delivery infrastructure that sits outside on the edge. One, there's a lot more control and a lot more availability to go through and cache up content through an AWS CDN network than you could ever invest in on-premise. So customer-facing applications make total sense to start with to deploy inside AWS because then you're gonna be leveraging that global availability and deployment model plus all the availability and backup and the multi-region deployments and the multi-availability zones that are available there. So it provides that whole resiliency that you can probably struggle to do on-prem, okay? On-prem, in some cases, we run applications like financials and everything, but it comes down to, do you have certain data residency requirements inside um, BC as an example that you need to manage, and if you do, then that might make sense to keep some of that stuff on-prem, okay? What we're seeing a lot of is, uh, just to build on what Mark was saying, is um, clients that are looking at moving dev tests, for example, right, from uh, prem to uh, and then kind of building from there, right? And we've seen, like, once an organization sees the value in that, and then, uh, you know, again, whether it's a specific group that's driving that, that sells that win amongst their business, it, it really kind of snowballs from there, right, in terms of, okay, you know what, we want to try something else. <laughs> and the unique thing that we do offer is clients that want to experiment, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're actually, are different programs that we can help clients with, right, through Fuse Forward and Cologix to actually do POCs, we call them proof of concepts, right, so we can actually help fund those things as well. So don't be shy of asking uh, our partners and us, right, like, you know, again, we'd like to try something or experiment on something. Um, you know, uh, how can we do that together, right, uh, as a joint investment opportunity, right? We're delighted uh, to do that because a lot of times that's what kind of you guys need to help sell the business, right, on, on a few things as well, right? so. Any other questions? I have a question regarding the Direct Connect, but it's a bit uh, specific. Uh, the minimum number of links that we can provide, as you know, when you want to establish the connection, there are three options that you have. The first one is the development and test. 
Um, unfortunately, the, the minimum is uh, two links, uh, which is based on the micro, um, you know Amazon's SLA, yeah. which is understandable. But again, if it is for the development and test purposes, you don't need the resiliency, you don't need the mm -hmm. back when these kinds of things. The first agenda might be to lower the price for the establishing a direct connect and everything. So I was wondering if there is such a possibility. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah. I know your answer, I know mine. They're two different answers. Yeah. Um, this feedback, we've heard it. Uh, and uh, there's requests that have got in to provide some flexibility around that, let's just say that, right? I can't promise when it'll come out, but we have shared that feedback multiple times, right? So From our perspective, we basically own all of our own direct connects and we give you just a virtual circuit across. It'll demark in your VPC in your account and we basically can provide that as part of our service. That's a great point. So what we do is you just want, in fact, we have customers as low as, we, we've got, we can go as low as, uh, we, we usually standardize it around 200 megabits per second on a single note, on a single connection. That's usually our entry point, but we can even go lower. But it's all part of our shared infrastructure that we do. Okay. Okay, so that allows you to go through and leverage our capacity as part of a service. Okay, and it doesn't need to be resilient, even though what we typically do, though, is we put in a direct connect and we still configure up a VPN. <coughs> okay, so is Cold Logics and uh, Geosport, are they behind actually uh, the Express Route service in the companies? You mean direct connect? Is Sorry, say it. Express route. No, Express route is Azure. The other service. Yeah, yeah, the, the other guys. The equivalent service yeah. for from Azure. Yeah. Express route is Azure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then Direct Connect is AWS. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we're on like we have our own Direct Connects that we plug into things like these cloud marketplaces, and once we're there, we actually will work with an ISP to plug in a customer into that site, but we'll manage it as a fully managed service. Okay. Last question. Could you speak a little bit about service level agreement? Uh, because in that chart you have what is managed within uh, AWS. AWS, what you manage, what customer manage. So let's say if we stay with that model, what is service level agreement going to be like between the customer, you choose forward in the middle, and AWS and one? So AWS provides for each one of their products a certain service level agreement, okay? It comes down to resiliency, uptime metrics. Um, but one of the key things that they always say is, we will provide this level of uptime, you can give the numbers, yeah, okay? 99.9 yeah. 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 storage services, the nines or eight eight nine. Nine. Uh, durability, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 So it's durability for the storage for, for EC2 and all of those, it's within a region, they're fairly, there's usually about three or four nines. Yeah. Then when we get into the fuse forward side, we basically say if it's our product, what we do is our standard is we always do a three uh, availability zone deployment, so we manage our own, and our service level is usually within a three or four nines, depending on what you need, okay? So we go into that. Then when it's applications inside, which is your operating environment, your apps, then the question is, is what's your price? Okay, how much do you want to spend? And what's your level of risk for a downtime? And that will define whether it gets deployed in one region, gets deployed in multi-regions with full failover, okay? And that all comes down to the, the level of resiliency per application that we define, and that gives you an SLA, okay? On the infrastructure side of things, uh, we have the, the nines as well. I think we have ten nines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That means that, hey, you know, I'm always scared on the floor because it's like 20 minutes, or it's like you got three minutes a month. Yeah, but for, for us, you know, we're down to CSK. So on the cooling and, and power side of things, we put in the measures so that your uptime is, is guaranteed with us, and, and all the measures are taken care of. And that's really a way that. AWS is able to translate those nines to their customers yeah. because of, of yeah. what we're guaranteeing to them as far as uptime. So I don't know if Raheem knows this, but uh, when AWS was kicking the tires on deploying the on ramp in our data center downtown here, um, they actually, one of the contingencies was that we added another one megawatt generator to our existing infrastructure 
to create an N plus one facility, meaning we have an extra megawatt of backup than what the data center's capacity is actually able of consuming. And we said, sure, no problem, AWS, we will do it. We did it, and Thank you. they said, great. So that's that's the level of partnership that we have with the cloud service providers and uh, the infrastructure that we're providing them to make sure they're able to make good on their promises to, to you guys, to, to our mutual customers. Really.